Welcome to Satisfied, a monthly program on the The Generation podcast designed to offer practical tools based on biblical principles so that anyone can experience full purity and lead others to do the same. Hello, and welcome back to the Satisfied program on the The Generation podcast. This is Ryan, and I look forward to finishing up our series on emotional purity uh, today, at least for the most part, finishing it up. Uh, this podcast was supposed to come out last week. If you noticed, our schedule got bumped a little bit here on the The Generation Network because uh, my wife and I and our son, Parker, were in El Paso, Texas, where he had surgery. He was diagnosed uh, a couple of months ago with sagittal craniosynostosis, and uh, it's just a developmental issue with the skull, but uh, thankfully it's completely treatable. Many of you were praying about that. There were there were hundreds that were praying for him, and uh, it just went so well. So we appreciate your prayers on that and pray for his continued healing. But he doesn't know anything hit him. Uh, he's a happy little boy still, so uh, we're very thankful to the Lord for how that went. Then also I wanted to quickly just mention that uh, the Cord app is coming along. We're about to move into the second stage of development into more of the back-end coding and uh, stuff like that. We're working with our developers right now. They have pretty much finished our branding. Um, we'll have to, we'll update the uh, website and landing page for the Cord app soon with the new branding and logo, uh, but it's, it's really exciting. It's, it's coming along and looking great. So we were able to put the first $10,000 down on that, uh, send a, a check-in for that uh, a couple weeks ago. And we've got another 26 due here pretty soon, so be praying with us about that. Moving into our discussion for today, uh, I kind of introduced it in our last podcast, and just tell you, it's it's uh, n- not really a super easy one to find the balance on and give, but I feel like it's a discussion that that needs to happen. Uh, even Paul will will be in First Corinthians seven today, and uh, we've been there before when we discussed uh, it's good for man not to touch a woman we talked about the the idea of the touch that kindles a fire uh, that burning within us um, we'll be in that again today but i just find it interesting that as i'm struggling and wrestling through how to present this in the right way and the, the balanced approach uh, even paul in that passage before he gets to the subject matter that we'll be discussing today uh, from this passage, even Paul says, but I speak this by permission and not of commandment. <laughs> it's almost like Paul saying, can I say something uh, off the record real quick? <laughs> and the Holy Spirit says, no, it's going in. <laughs> and therefore, we're able to read it today. But but he he's saying, can I go off the record with, with something real quick? Because I feel like I, it needs to be said, but it's not the easiest thing to to say, to present, and that's kind of how I feel as I'm, I'm discussing it as well. But uh, I want to present to you just uh, several trends uh, in regard to marriage and the family over the past 50, 60 years. So if we were going back to about the 1960s and, uh, and, and look at the trend in our, in our culture towards marriage and the family, we would see a, uh, a tremendous increase in divorce rate. In fact, even just from 1960 to 1980, the divorce rate doubled. Uh, we would see the rates of uh, cohabitation, those living together out of marriage, uh, skyrocketing to where it's just absolutely the norm today in our culture. Uh, and then in turn, the amount of children out of wedlock, of course, uh, the, is again, very, very normal and a, a huge increased rate there. So we, we see these trends uh, from over the last 50 years that uh, are clearly immoral trends. They are very negative and have affected our culture in very, very negative ways. But there's another trend that I want to point to that actually we as even Christians has, have viewed this as a, as a neutral, amoral trend. And actually, I've, I've never even heard it discussed before, to be honest. But it's a very clear, demonstrable trend that you can find in just about any uh, study of, of marriage and family demographics, uh, studying our culture. You can find these numbers. It's not, not difficult to find. Uh, but let me give this to you. In 1960, 
if we took the age bracket, 18 to 24-year-olds, 45% of 18 to 24-year-olds were married. They were married by that point, 18 to 24, 45%. If we were to move up to 2010, when this, this particular study was done in 2010, so not even to today, in that same bracket, 18 to 24-year-olds, it's not 45%, it's dropped to 9%. 9% are married by ages 18 to 24. In fact, if we were to go to the next age bracket, 25 to 34, uh, we would see in 1960, 82% of those in that age bracket, 25 to 34, were married. But not 82%. In 2010, it dropped to 44%. So in other words, there were more people married in the age bracket of 18 to 24. There were more 18 to 24-year-olds married in 1960 than there are 25 to 34-year-olds married today. Let's look at a different study. If we were to take a, uh, a larger age group from 18 all the way up to 32, and if we were to look by generation, the 1960 generation, the silent generation, it was called 65% of those in that age bracket of 18 to 32 were married. The boomer generation in 1980, 48%. Gen X, 36%. And millennial, 26%. So we went from 65 to 48 to 36 to 26. What a decline, huge, huge decline in the rate of marriage. In 1965, the typical American woman first married at age 21 and the typical man at 23. But by 2017, those figures had changed now, the average age of a, a woman first married moved from 21 to 27, and for a man, it moved from 23 to 30. So what is this? What's going on with marriage? Well, a, a study was actually done and just asked uh, those that were polled, is marriage becoming obsolete? And 40% said that they believed marriage was becoming obsolete. It was even higher in the age bracket of 18 to 24, 45% said that marriage was becoming obsolete. Now, I know probably the majority of you that are listening to this who are single, which is our vast audience, um, probably the majority of you are getting kind of excited at this point and saying, oh man, I'm looking forward to the application from this. Here we go. We go all the way through a series on emotional impurity, and then finally it comes at the end, y'all need to just go out and get married. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, th I know that's probably the application you're hoping for, but it's not quite where I'm going with this, okay? Not quite. We need to answer that question, though. Why are people getting married later? And there's many explanations that have been given, but one that uh, is, I think, the most legitimate that, that stands out in several of these studies is just simply the fact that we are not nearly in a condition to get married at that young age as they were 50 years ago. There has been a change in the maturity and the focus and the vision and the even career path. There has been such a change uh, in, our, in our young people uh, to the point where uh, one study done said that men are usually not emotionally mature for marriage until they're 30 years old now. Women are not emotionally mature for this level of commitment until they're past 25 years of age, 30 and 25. Yeah, there you go, guys. And you thought the emotions was a lady's problem. Now, 30 years old, you're not, you're not mature. This is a secular study done. It says uh, you, the men are not mature enough for marriage until they're 30 years old and the women at 25. There's a vast difference in, uh, if you're 18 years old, there's a huge difference in what an 18-year-old is today and what an 18-year-old was 50 years ago. An incredible difference. In fact, if we were to go way back a couple hundred years ago, children ages 7 to 12 comprised one-third of the factory workforce. 7 to 12. What are 7 to 12-year-olds doing nowadays? Children in rural areas began working on the farm at 5 years old. Responsibilities grew as they got older and parents prepared them for marriage. Young women would marry as young as 15 years old a couple hundred years ago. The pioneer children had to know not just how to tend the farm, but how to defend it uh, as well from violent intruders that were common at that point. 
And this age bracket that we call teenagers did not even exist. It wasn't a thing. You were either a child or you were an adult. There was no in-between. And every child was simply preparing for adulthood and marriage. Why were these children being given these huge tasks on the farm and uh, being pushed to their limits? Well, it was because they were being prepared to take these on for themselves, to take the farm or start their own. Or The young ladies were uh, being actually trained in home economics and culinary arts and homemaking and these things. That was a training from uh, as young as it gets, whereas today, whereas today many young ladies want nothing to do with a, a focus in learning on that. You see, 50 years ago, the reason that we can look at these statistics and see how many were married is because they had been preparing for marriage since they were ch children. That has been a focus. They had been preparing for adulthood. But today, we kick that can as far down the road as we can. Today, we want to stay a teenager all the way up into our 30s or more. And you can see the maturity level is not that much different many times. I remember talking to a guy that was turning 20 from 19 and he was so disappointed he just he wanted to stay he and he told me that i want to stay a teenager teenage life has been so much fun i don't want to move on and so i'm presenting to you that the trend in the statistics of marriage and our decline in the amount of marriages today has a direct correlation to a focus on ourselves to a lack of preparation for marriage we are not taking life seriously. I'm not saying that we need to turn the dial back 100 years ago and delete every youth activity and youth camp and everything, but we do need to watch the effect that it has had on our culture and especially in one particular area. And this is when we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. This is where uh, Paul uh, gives that disclaimer <laughs> and says, can I go off the record here for a second because I'm about to say something that's going to get me in trouble. <laughs> and first he proposes that it's not a bad thing just to remain single. He says to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But, he says, if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. Now it's that same uh, it's the same passage that we talked through before, the touch that kindleth is better. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. And now that same uh, desire, that uh, that innate uh, burning is discussed and in, in given in this verse and saying it is better to marry than to burn. Now, first, we need to clear up the misconception uh, that marriage marriage is not going to solve your lust issue. That's not how it works. However, you're in a very vulnerable position as a single person, very vulnerable, especially in today in the way uh, that uh, sexuality is so publicized and, and literally just uh, coming after you from every corner. And uh, our, our culture is geared towards ensnaring people sensually. You are in a very precarious position as a single person without a proper way to physically satisfy those desires. Now, we have discussed in great detail in podcasts in the past how Jesus can be that satisfaction for you, and that is the entire point of uh, our Satisfied program here, is that Jesus can be all of that for you, and even into marriage. If Jesus uh, stops being your satisfaction even in marriage, you're still going to have issues uh, within marriage. So marriage is not the cure-all. That's not, that's not the point. Uh, it's not that it's going to solve your problem. It's going to be Jesus before marriage. It's going to be Jesus after marriage. That never changes. However, you are in a very precarious position as a single person, and that's what Paul is saying. He's saying uh, there is a burning desire within you, and that desire was made for marriage. It wasn't a mistake. God put that desire there, and he put that desire there to be fulfilled in marriage. It is the purpose of it. Does that mean it's God's plan that everyone get married? No, not necessarily. It's not. And uh, that's a certain gifting, actually, the gifting of uh, singlehood that Paul discusses in this passage. He says some are gifted that way. There's different gifts, and, and he is uh, admitting that, noting that. But for the majority, 
God has designed that that desire in you be met inside of marriage. And so it's difficult to discuss and to have a program on uh, purity for uh, single young adults uh, in our audience without actually saying, you know what, this is a God-given desire. And it was given to lead you to your spouse. It was given to draw you to your spouse within marriage. Now, wouldn't it make sense then that if the devil was going to try to attack and ensnare in the moral arena, that he would not only make these temptations so much more prevalent and drag our culture through the uh, immoral dirt, but would he also take away that God-given safe haven of marriage and put that on a decline so that there are more and more unmarried uh, uh, young people in a precarious position without any uh, way to physically properly satisfy those desires, a burning of lust. I think it makes total sense and we should have seen it coming. This is not a non-moral trend, it's an attack from the devil. But the answer is not, oh, we just need to go out there and get married faster. Because you ain't ready to get married. <laughs> The reason that you're not married is not because you uh, looked on the trends on marriage.com and discovered people aren't getting married until they're 32 nowadays, so I guess I'm waiting. No, the reason you're not getting married is because you're not ready. Now, I understand that uh, to be quote-unquote ready for marriage, we could be waiting our entire lives, and we're always growing in that, and those of us that are married would be the first to tell you that uh, every week we learn something new about, uh, about marriage, and you'll never be totally ready for marriage before marriage. That's not the point. But I'm just saying when you look at a group of teenagers in a youth group and try to picture married couples <laughs> serving the Lord in ministry, it's getting harder and harder to do that. It's getting harder to do it even with college students, to be honest. And I could tell you, I wasn't married till I was 26, but I wasn't ready a day sooner. <laughs> it wasn't because I didn't want to get married sooner than that. But the Lord had so much more to teach me, and I was not prepared. And if you know my testimony, you know that, that I was not ready at that point. So as we conclude, let me ask you to consider where you're at. Again, you absolutely can and must get victory as a single person in the moral arena. You must. You absolutely must. And Jesus is everything for you. But I want you to think ahead and plan uh, ahead because God likely has a much bigger plan for you and likely does have a plan for marriage for you. So uh, let's think ahead. Men, what are you doing to prepare yourself for marriage? Can you picture yourself right now as a husband or a father? And maybe you should ask somebody else that knows you because <laughs> we can be deceived a little bit. Uh, ask your parents. Ask maybe a, a youth pastor or a godly friend in your life. Hey, could you see me as a, as a married person right now? What do, you, what do you think needs to change? Ask the Lord and the Holy Spirit to point things out in your life. Uh, what things need to change in my life? Start hanging out with older men in your life. Start hanging out. Take a guy out in your church that uh, has been as a seasoned uh, man. Maybe someone that knows you and can point things, point things out in your life. Or maybe just someone that you respect enough and just could ask him for for counsel on what it would take to prepare yourself for marriage. I mean, even if you're a 13, 14 year old, uh, get out there, start asking uh, uh, how you can prepare for marriage. That is a great thing. Sit down with your dad and say, hey dad, you know me, you've seen me. What things need to change before I can be married? Because even if it's not until I'm 26, uh, I need to start preparing for this now. And another thing, get desperate to know God's will for your lives. You know, our young people today don't hardly start considering uh, what they're going to do with their lives until they're, I mean, at the very least going into their freshman year of college, if they're going to college. Um, many times it's after that. So many are changing their majors partway through because they're still not really sure what they're doing and, and what direction they're going. And why don't we get desperate about this when we're a teenager or when uh, even in our early teens, when you're 13, 14 years old, let's get desperate and, and get a vision and find God's plan for our life. Ladies, I want you to think of the type 
of man that you picture yourself completing, that you think God in his perfect plan would have you to complete someday, to be a wife to, that kind of man, and ask yourself, what kind of wife would that man be attracted to? It's probably not going to be your average, uh, loose, scandalous, uh, silly, flippant, flirtatious teenage girl. A man like that that God has for you is probably one that he's going to need, he's going to be a family man. He's going to need uh, someone that he can trust to raise to help raise his children. He's going to need someone who can keep a, a godly home. He's going to be a strong leader. That's what you want in a husband. And so in that case, he's going to need a strong, supportive, encouraging partner. You're going to want him to be pure and single-minded so you yourself should be pure, appropriate, and modest. You're going to want that man to be wise and thoughtful, the man that God has for you, so you yourself are going to need to be meek and under control and reserved. Young men and young ladies, as we conclude our discussion on emotional impurity. We are up against a huge battle in any purity realm today. It is a massive, massive battle. You have everything you need in Christ, but there is one desire that the Lord has designed and would love for you to be able to fulfill within marriage. It's the way it was designed to be. It's what he wants. And I think it's appropriate because it is in God's plan for most of us that we start thinking and preparing for marriage. But instead of preparing for marriage in the way that our culture tells us to, just by going out and seeking and, and trying to find that one, as one friend of mine put it, why don't we make the focus on being that right one? So that when God says it's time, then you're ready. You've prepared yourself. You are ready to be that right one. Young people, it absolutely is better to marry than to burn in Paul's understatement of the epistle. So let's get serious about marriage and start seeking the Lord's help in preparing yourself. Don't be like those in your culture today that couldn't care less about thinking about the future because they're all about here and now. They're living for their sports. They're living for their video games. They're living for their friends. Get your eyes off of the here and now and the present and start asking the Lord for a vision for your future. Let me conclude with this. I remember one thing being very frustrating going through uh, college especially, and then it seems like every stage, is that there will always be people that tell you, oh, you think your freshman year is hard. You just wait till your sophomore year. Oh, you think your sophomore year is hard. You should just wait till your junior year. And when you're a junior, you think your junior year is hard. You just wait until you're a senior. And uh, then when you're finally standing and ready for graduation, then they tell you, oh, you think college was hard. You just wait until you graduate. And life gets just so much harder. And so then you graduate and then you're in real life and then they just, oh, you just wait till you get married and then you get married. You just wait till you have kids and then you have a kid. You just wait till you have five kids and it just, it, <laughs> it never ends and maybe uh, you can relate. But I remember just being so frustrated because I can honestly look at where I'm at today and being married with a kid and even going through a, uh, a trial with him and the surgery. I mean, I'm sure there's, there's so many more trials down the road and things we'll have to work through. But I can honestly look at where I'm at and saying, this is awesome. I love where I'm at. It's never been better. Never. And I look back to my freshman year when, the, and when people first started saying, oh, you just wait until you're, you know, it's just going to get worse from here, brother. It's going to get more and more difficult. And I'd say my freshman year was the pits compared to what God has for me today. And I want to get that in your head. Where you're at right now as a teenager, you think it's all great. You think it's glorious. And people tell you, oh, it's, enjoy it now while it lasts because life just goes downhill from here. And it's not true. Look, enjoy what God has for you today, but it gets so much better. So much better. Get your eyes off the present. Start getting a vision for the future. God has so much more in store for you. Now, what I want to do in our next podcast, instead of moving uh, right on into another series is actually to take one more uh, opportunity to answer questions, to discuss things we might have missed, maybe to rehash some things. I've, I've gotten some questions uh, via text or 
uh, email that I just haven't really had a chance to respond to, or maybe they were addressed in a previous podcast, but um, just the the way that the, the questions have come up, maybe I need to reiterate on some, some of those things. Uh, maybe you just have something that you feel like God has given you that has helped you in emotional purity, you'd like to share it with others, send that in to me. And if it's something I think would be appropriate and fit in, I'd love to share it. I'm still learning myself in this area. We're growing together. So I'd love to get your thoughts on it. Feel free to send in any questions or thoughts you might have. And I look forward to that discussion we have in our next podcast. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for sticking with us. And uh, we'll look forward to hearing from you. If you have something to contribute to that podcast, you can email me at satisfied at thegeneration.org. We'll talk to you next time as we continue to learn how to be less gratified and more satisfied with Jesus Christ. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the The Generation Podcast. If you've been blessed or helped in any way by this episode or any other episodes, please consider sharing what God has done in your life. Your testimony could be exactly what someone else needs to take their own step out of the boat. To share your testimony, please visit thegeneration.org slash testimony.